we know we're going to close because we 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 have unbelievable lender connections. We know the deal is good. We know we know it makes sense. We know our investors are going to respond well to it before we even have a signed LOI. Um, and all of that is a byproduct of really understanding where you're investing. Welcome to the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and the founder of Catani Capital Group. For the last two years, I've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators influencers, and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up, guys? And welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I'm joined today by Axel Ragnarsson. <laughs> Axel is a raise master, a wizard, and he's the founder of Align Real Estate Partners, which has been a principal party in $40 million worth of transactions since inception. Currently, Align Rep owns over 400 units of multifamily real estate valued at $35 million. He also hosts the Multifamily Wealth Podcast, one of the most highly rated podcasts in the industry. Axel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Johnny. Looking forward to it. Likewise, likewise. Yeah, your last name is... A little bit more challenging under the gun. So <laughs> when the when the lights are on and the record button is pressed, yeah, definitely it's a big mash, just mashup of letters for sure. When you're trying to just like run through, you know, that's the funny thing is I've said this intro, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred times now. And so then you throw in a name and your brain all of a sudden like has to actually think about it. You're like, wait a second. You have but, to remove uh, yourself from the the script. Yeah, exactly. 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 Well, we're grateful to have you. Um, looking forward to today's conversation. Obviously, you know, we're chatting offline. You have a massive month uh, ahead of you and in all the, the best ways, but we'll kind of get to that. Um, we also touched on your story. So I want to start with that. Kind of talk to us about when you discovered real estate and kind of the power and what led you to where you're at now. Sure. So um, I'll breeze through the early parts. Um, I was I was born and raised in New Hampshire. I live in Boston now. Um, so I've always been in the Northeast. Uh, parents were entrepreneurs, business owners. Um, they ran a, a business that sold wood chippers. <laughs> so nothing to do with real estate, but I was kind of exposed to business at an early age. And um, growing up was always doing, you know, anything I could outside of work a job to make some money. So I was always buying and selling stuff. I was I was that like stereotypical kid. Um, that, uh, you know, flipping Xboxes on Craigslist and, and making some money here and there. So late high school, early college, I started buying and selling cars. And that was kind of the business I was running, um, making decent money for that age. And one day I was like, all right, this is not a long term plan. This is not something I, I think I want to do like after college. Um, but I always knew I wanted to run a business after I got out of school or work for myself in some capacity. So started learning about what else I could buy and sell, what other kind of proven business models there were. And um, through a variety of Google searches, I stumbled upon real estate investing and um, started learning about flipping houses and wholesaling and rental real estate and all the different strategies. And what really spoke to me was, um, you know, was rental properties, buying, buying multifamily uh, properties and the passive income that came with that. So uh, buckle down, figure out how I could start buying, you know, small multifamily properties as a college kid and, and as someone that, you know, didn't have a W-2 and wasn't really financeable. And then I stumbled upon the world of private money lending and creative deal structure. And one thing leads to another. I um, started buying small multis uh, towards the tail end of when I was in college and then after college. And I started organically growing a portfolio just through finding really great deals and creatively structuring them. And I did that for three, four years, um, built a portfolio that was, yeah, I guess, relatively sizable for that age, I guess, if you're going to, you know, throw some relativity on it, but um, replaced my income. And, and I was, you know, in a position where I could either keep doing that uh, with my own money, or I could scale and buy larger properties and, and maybe bring in some investor money. And I always knew that's kind of the route I wanted to go. I was just too afraid to go do it. But I, after a while, I was like, I definitely have the skill set here to bring in some investors into the types of deals that we're doing. And um, and that's when I started doing that. So around 2020, we started raising money and uh, started buying some deals in other markets as well. So so now we buy in Central Florida. We have a few deals down there. Um, and then up in, you know, I live in Boston, an hour north of me up in New Hampshire is the other market we buy in. Started a property management company. We're vertically integrated. Um, you know, we're raising money in the traditional syndication model. And starting to to actually scale the business, and that really brings us to today. Um, you know, we're we're like a significant equity holder slash GP of um, you know about four hundred units of real estate, 
Um, and you know, our management company up there manages our New Hampshire stuff. And we also do some third party. We manage about 400 units. Um, and then we got some properties down in Florida as well. So, so the business has been growing, staying busy and, um, hoping to continue, continue down this road, long story short. Absolutely. I love it. That's such a great story. And, um, you know, again, we were, we were chatting offline, uh, just how, how solid of a strategy it is and, and honestly tried and true, right? I, how many guests I've had who've done the same thing, right? You start buying your own kind of starting in that small range, get that track record. And then, you know, first a deciding if that's even what you want to do. Right. I feel like you should be going out and buying your own before you're, you know, to make sure it's even what you want to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're obviously we're we're biased, but I mean, man, it's a lot of fun. So. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But I totally agree with that statement. I think, you know, I think it's, um, well, one, if you think about how you can compete in this business, right. If you're somebody that is trying to get into real estate and you've never done a real estate deal, like what's easier going out there and finding a really good deal on a four unit building, for example, and buying that yourself. And, you know, you, you run it yourself, you get the cash flow every month and you're, and you're making real money pretty quickly or trying to raise money for somebody else's extremely sizable deal But raising money is really hard when you haven't done a deal. You don't have a good story to really tell investors. You don't really have a feel for the business. And then you as a, you know, as an investor yourself, don't really know how to evaluate deals yet. You know, you know, you're not in the game yet. So um, for me, I think going the first route is oftentimes the fastest way to traction as well. I mean, it's a lot easier to go out there and make some cold calls, send them, send some direct mail and get a really good four unit deal. And then you do an eight unit and then a 16. And then you're like, all right, now I'm going to go raise for some other people's deals because I kind of know the game. Um, and I, I, you know, I have proof of concept. So I totally agree with that for sure. Totally. I love it. Yeah. And, and it, and it, and it does work, right. Obviously, like we said, and, and so you kind of touch on something we'll kind of jump into now. Your big thing is really off market, right? Direct to seller. Uh, now a little bit is in a different market than I, and, and you can kind of touch on this up there in uh, New Hampshire, kind of the economics there, but kind of talk about, you know, did you start with this strategy? You're kind of discovering the power of this strategy. And now obviously you're, you're teaching people how to do it. Yeah. So for me, it was, that was always how I knew that I could participate in the business. Um, I had someone tell me early on a really successful real estate investor. This is back like 2015. He was like, if you can consistently find really good deals, like you'll you'll always have a place in this business, um, yeah. and it's pretty black and white. And I think on the flip side too, you know, if you can always raise money, you're also going to always have a place. Um, so you know, I decided, hey, I'm going to focus on the deal side because I don't know anyone that's going to give me money. So that's where I'm going to spend my time. And um, so I, I started immediately sending out direct mail, um, you know, sending emails directly to owners, prospecting to for rent ads, you know, just doing anything I could to get on the phone with sellers and just start building relationships, get my name out there, right? Planting those seeds. And uh, just as anything in business, you know, is it, it compounds, right? It, the first year we did two, the next year, I think we did, I say we, you know, me and I had a, a VA helping me with this at the time. I think we did five deals the next year. And maybe seven or 10 the next. And, and then obviously it all starts to compound and grow and grow. And, you know, you sell some that you've owned for a couple of years and roll those, you know, those proceeds into slightly bigger ones. And the goal was we got to buy deals at a price that allows me to pull all my money out in six months or else I, I'm going to be stuck because I'm not making enough money outside of real estate to go funnel into real estate. And I wasn't raising money. So that wasn't really an option for me. So that was my you know, introduction to the real estate business and did that, you know, in in three, four years grew to about 70, 80 doors that, you know, that I owned. And it was, and then once you're at that place, you're like, all right, now I have a lot of different options, right? I can go take down bigger deals, maybe myself. I can go partner with other people on their deals, help them on the operation side. I can go raise money because I have a good story now and I have experience or I could just keep doing what I'm doing and just buying great deals and safely growing the portfolio. Um, But I knew that, you know, that was always my focus and it still is our focus. Now we just do it at a higher volume. And uh, I think in the last three years, we've done 30 plus deals direct to seller ranging from five to 50 units. Um, You know, we've, we got a 48 unit in Florida that was direct to seller, 28 unit. Um, We have 60 units under contract right now between a few different deals that are all direct to seller. And we're buying them at pricing that for our investors, because now we're raising money. Um, really de-risk the deal up front and allows us to much more effectively operate it with less stress and less, you know, with a, with a wider margin for error. 
And then personally, I'm still buying deals for myself. And that's still the model. It's like, you got to get in at a really good basis, a really good price so that you can add the value, create all this big spread between what you're into it for and what it's worth. And then you can pull your money out and do it again. So that was always the, the strategy that I knew that I could you know, focus on and I could control. Um, and now, you know, I'm just trying to spend more of my time to raise money, which is a lot harder than just finding good deals. In my opinion, some other people might say that's not the case, but in my opinion, that's, that's kind of the reality of the business. So I, I, I continue to focus on the deal side. Absolutely. I love it. That's awesome. And, you know, one thing I see a lot with people who are new or wanting to get into this, right. And, and I totally agree with you. I tell people all the time, two ways into this industry that you'll always have a seat at the table, finding good deals and providing capital. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that. But one thing I notice a lot is, you know, uh, people want, obviously want to buy deals, right? They're like, oh, you know, especially now they're like, oh, I'll kind of take a deal everywhere. And they don't even know what market they want to be in or why they mm. want to be in certain markets, right? They're not really analyzing, doing the correct analysis, kind of touch on, you know, and I know you have obviously your modules now and, and um, we can touch on that, but kind of touch on, you know, why knowing your market is so crucial so you can understand this value. And um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll quickly touch on how we arrived at the markets we buy in, and then I'll talk about the importance of knowing it, you know, and I think there's, I just want to make a comment before I get into the second part, which is, um, when I wanted to go out of state and start buying in the Southeast kind of Midwest, I was still trying to figure out where I wanted to buy, I probably, you know, did the Google analysis, Google searches, city data.com kind of demographic analysis on probably like 15, 20 cities. And they all tell you, hey, people are moving here, income is growing, jobs are growing. And you kind of, it's so easy to get analysis paralysis if you don't have like a clear focus on where you want to be. So I was looking anywhere from Nashville to Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina to, you know, Tampa, Florida. And eventually I was like, I just have to pick a place. Like I, I have to pick one place and I have to go deep or else you're just completely spinning your tires. So we settled on Lakeland, Florida as the, the, the one market we were going to try and go into out of state, which is, you know, right between Tampa and Orlando. It's located extremely well. And um, it's not a major city. It's, you know, a little over 100,000 people there. That extended area is a couple hundred thousand. But we were like, this is a tertiary market where we can compete. I can't compete in Tampa with everybody in Tampa, everybody in Florida, everybody in the Southeast, everybody in the country, basically, which is where I started when I started looking at Florida. But Lakeland, 45 minutes away, I can compete there because I'm competing against local folks. So I think it's so important when you're selecting markets to be honest about what you're trying to do. Like my own thing was like, I want to go find off market deals at a really good price to de-risk this whole thing for me. It's going to be extremely hard to find those in Tampa, but it's going to be easier to find them in Lakeland. So that's that's kind of why we settled on that area and how we think about picking markets. I want to be where other people aren't, but where people are still going. And then, you know, obviously we buy up in New Hampshire, which is my hometown, and it's an hour north of Boston, so it's convenient. But in terms of the importance of understanding your market, I mean, this is kind of changing now as it gets a little bit easier to find deals right now. It's still challenging because there's a gap between what buyers and sellers are willing to pay. You know, we're, we're having this conversation early December 2022. But if you're talking a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, if a good deal hits your desk, you, you needed to be able to act on it like within the hours that it had been sent to you, right? You have to be able to, to work quickly. So there's not enough time. There, there wasn't, and there still really isn't nowadays, enough time to, 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 to talk with a seller or talk with a broker, take down all the details of a deal, hop into your underwriting spreadsheet and spend two hours playing around with the numbers, do some rent comps, you know, speak with a GC about, hey, what do you think it's going to cost to renovate all these two bedroom units? Talk with your property management company about the area and about the neighborhood. All of those things are things you should do, but you don't really have time to do those if a deal is really compelling, unless there's like literally nobody else looking at it, but that's so rarely the case nowadays, even sellers are calling up multiple people if they don't want to work with a broker. So you have to know your market in terms of, you have to know the average price per unit. You have to know the rents for that unit. You have to know at a street by street level, where is good and where's not. You have to know your construction costs from a per square foot basis. What's it going to cost to do all this construction? Um, you need to know, you know, uh, how your property management company feels about that area. Are they going to be excited to manage there? Are they going to be a little reticent? You have to know all these things before the deal hits your desk so that you can be out, you know, LOI out the door in 30 minutes. Um, and that's, I think that's the, that's what I define as really knowing your market. 
Because if you really want to compete and you want to take down really good deals, you don't want to be just another buyer competing with everybody else doing the same, you know, buying deals at market or above market. You need to be able to act at, at speeds like that. And that all, and understanding your market also allows you to get more aggressive with terms too, which is something that, that we regularly do where we have, you know, we don't have a financing contingency in pretty much all of our offers, right? We, we, you know, after due diligence, our money's not refundable and, we know we're going to close because we 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 have unbelievable lender connections. We know the deal is good. We know we know it makes sense. We know our investors are going to respond well to it before we even have a signed LOI. Um, and all of that is a byproduct of really understanding where you're investing. I love that. That's such a great method, right? Basically, more or less having your back of napkin numbers so you can look at it, throw them in there, and you know get that LOI out. And then, of course. After that's done, then, you know, throw it into the underwriting and actually break it down. But when you, you know, do that and, and get that methodology, of course, if a deal ends up not being good, you know, you have plenty of time to, to, to walk away. So I know one big question people have, and, and, you know, we don't have to get into the details because again, I know you have a paid, um, paid education on this, but kind of touch on some, some of the keys to direct a seller and, and really getting that machine going so that you know it starts to provide real good deal flow yeah absolutely um you know the big thing is you got to start you know one understand the market before you do anything right so do all that other stuff so that when the good deals hit your desk you can act quickly on them and then two you want to go out there and you want to buy a really good um filtered data list right from like a list source or a prop stream or a reonomy if you want to go get like a subscription to a, a platform that helps you with this and it's basically you know what you want to do is filter down to the, the the areas that you want to buy in the the units the the property size that you want to buy and then you want to remove any properties that have sold in the last few years because those sellers aren't those owners aren't going to be likely to want to sell because they just bought um that's broad brush strokes and then there's a million ways to filter beyond that but that's where i would start then what you want to do is you want to go in and hire a direct mail company like an open letter marketing or something like that um, to either send out mail on your behalf or send it out yourself, right? There's arguments to both. I, I won't dive into that right now because I know we're, you know, it'll take a while, but but send out some mail to this list. I recommend just hiring a company to help you with this um, because it's extraordinarily time consuming to do it yourself. So unless you have a surplus of time, just to have somebody else do it um, and try try to get a list of at least 500 properties to make it worth your while to do this. Um, anything lower than that, I mean, it's just you're not giving yourself enough bites of the apple. So send out your 500 letters. Then you want to go take that same list and you want to go skip trace it with like a lead Sherpa or a skip genie. Um, there's plenty of services that can help you with this. RE Simply is another one. And um, you want to get the name, the true owner names behind the LLCs if the property is owned by an LLC. Um, or just, you know, if it's owned by the owner, you want their phone number and their email. Um, and if it's an LLC, you want the true owner and then their phone number and email. And what you want to do after you send the mail, wait till the mail hits the mailbox, you know, seven, 10 days later, call the whole list, call everybody and, hey, and ask them if they got your mail piece, ask them if they're interested in selling their property and do so from like a very non-pushy standpoint. And if they don't just say, hey, I just want to, you know, network with somebody else in the market. It's good to talk with another owner. We're regularly buying, you know, let's, let's stay in touch type of thing. Um, and then few days after that, whoever doesn't respond, send them an email, right? Send out an email kind of summarizing what you'd say on the phone. And if you really want to spend some more time, you can personalize it to that property, that seller, if you do a little research on them. Um, you know, hey, I, I saw your buildings right down the street from, you know, that CVS. I, I made an offer in a building next door. I've been trying to buy in that area for a while. would love to talk with you about, about your property on Main Street, right? Send that out on the 15th of the month. So now you've touched everybody in three different ways. And if you just do that long enough, you'll just get deals. Unless you're unless you, you're terrible on the phone or you're just very unlikable or you're just doing something really wrong. But assuming that you're checking all the, the basic boxes, that that's how you find deals. I mean, we we follow that, um, a formula of that for for many years now. And um, and then above and beyond that, and you mentioned, you know, the course that we just came out with, like. The, there's a lot of little tweaks you can do there from a language standpoint, from you can send some personalized videos. This is how you can really personalize the email to, to pop out on the, in the seller's inbox. You know, these are some of the more specialized things you can do with your direct mail to really boost your response rates. And I think a lot of that stuff comes into play if you're looking at like 30, 40, 50 plus unit buildings where the sellers are a little more sophisticated, um, which, you know, again, different conversation, but that's like, that's the table stakes version of getting involved in, in direct to seller kind of marketing and all of that. 
And while you're doing all that, keep networking with people that find deals like property managers and brokers and other investors and wholesalers so that they're bringing you deals while you're going out to find deals. And um, you do that long enough, you'll just you'll just find good deals and uh, and the whole business becomes a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. It's not something that happens overnight. Another conversation we were having offline is how long it takes to get going in this business because results don't happen quickly, right? It's a, you know, I mean, on a deal by deal basis, it's years, but in this case, it's probably a few months before you're even getting any kind of traction, I would imagine. For sure. Yeah. And you have to, and that's, you know, the, the couple of mindset things you have to embrace are if you don't, if you won't do it forever, don't do it for a day, which is something that I've recently started to like really take into account in terms of what we're doing because we do everything in business to do it for a few years and then it compounds and we hit the hockey stick like that's kind of every business you got to do things for a while and then the results explode um you know you could send out your first round of mail and do a deal you could send out two and then do a deal you could send out three and not do a deal it's kind of random in the short term but if you're planting those seeds over a six month period of time a nine month period of time a 12 month period of time it would be unreasonable to expect that you didn't do a deal in that time frame. And, you know, the other thing too, is if you're, if you're in multifamily, you know, real estate and you want to start doing this stuff, you, you can't think of money and time that you invest in direct to seller relationship development is what I like to call it as a, as an, a, you know, expense. It's not an expense. It's an investment. Um, if you spend 10 grand on mail over the, over the next year, um, you know, and let's say, let's say you send out 500 mailers every few months, right? That's kind of $500 in mail. And you do that four times a year. That's two grand in a year. Let's say you did that for five years and you spent 10 grand. You get one deal. You probably make six figures plus like it's so irrational to think that you don't earn a return on that. So it's just gauging the emotional um, expectations along the way, knowing that literally you do like one deal in our business pays for our marketing for the next five. Like that's lit we've we've done the math. That's just what happens. <laughs> it's just unreasonable to think that that wouldn't be a good a good strategy to implement. Assuming you're looking for these, you know, if you're looking at 200 plus unit deals, probably not a good use of your time because those folks aren't selling. You know, those <laughs> those folks are hiring brokers. But if you're yes. sub 100 units, this is a great use of your time for sure. That's awesome. I love it. And obviously, proven right. You guys have have done your deals and are now you know, you've got a big month coming up. So kind of talk about what's led to the decision for uh, the dispositions. And obviously, you've got some under contract to buy as well. Sure. So um, when I think about so I'm not, uh, I'm not one of those guys that's married to holding forever. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to buy some really quality assets and hold them for a very long time. But a lot of the deals we do are in C-class neighborhoods that, you know, maybe and in, in looking into the future, a little bit more operationally intensive to keep to keep owning. So if we buy those deals, create value, and we know that we can sell and, and, and earn a good return either for ourselves or if we have investors, you know, ourselves and our investors, we're probably going to sell because we want we want to use our time effectively as operators on the right deals. Um, so. We typically sell deals that are more fringy like that, maybe a little bit outside of our really core target markets. You know, maybe it's a town over or something like that. So a lot of that stuff we've been selling throughout this year because it's my opinion that pricing will be affected by what's going on with interest rates and just the overall economy in a year from now. So I'd rather get out now. Um, and as we sell, you know, I, I like to put money aside to invest at the business level in staff and marketing and software and all of the stuff to make the business grow. Like those are the investments that drive the deals and bring the investors um, versus rolling it into more properties, which, you know, we may, if we can earn 25, 30%, that's great. But I want to invest where I can earn 50, a hundred percent on, you know, returns on my investment, which is usually in staff and tools, systems, marketing, et cetera. So we'll still take some of our money and throw it into new deals. Um, you know, we're selling two right now. We're buying three in the month of December. And, um, the deals that we're buying, we're being extraordinarily selective about, and we're buying deals at pricing of, you know, 15, 20% below current market value for those properties. Um, you know, one of these deals we have in a contract for 105 a unit, um, it's, we could close it, we could hire a broker and we could sell it for 125 a unit the day that we close, not after we do anything, but like the day that we close. So that's kind of what, what, those deals are the ones I'm interested in getting into right now. And we're also buying everything with fixed rate debt. Um, you know, we're not doing any bridge stuff, no floating rate, 
A lot of this is light value add. They're not complex deals. So they're very easy to operate, manage, and to kind of project the success of those deals. We're not doing redevelopments or like major 20K plus a unit type value add CapEx type deals. So a lot of it's pretty turnkey. Um, everything we're buying right now is in New Hampshire. Um, and we own our we own the the property management company. So we we control all of that. So we feel really safe about doing those deals. Um and then, you know, but you still got to sell to create liquidity, even to to keep doing stuff. So um, the wheel keeps turning as I like to visualize it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm right there with you, especially, um, you know, like you said, right, is it's very common when you start on the, the smaller side in terms of um, unit size or, or unit count to to start to not hold those for 10 years, right? Once you get into that 100, 200, those are the ones, you know, three to five year refi. And then, you know, you hold that thing for life if you want. But, mm -hmm. you know, these small ones, like you said, you know, older vintage, class C, you know, those, you know, very, very common strategy to, you know, stabilize them and, and kind of eventually move on, especially like you said, you know, you can get good returns. And then that's what allows you to scale and which is what's happening now. What have you found? maybe some things that have been challenging and then some other, like you said, you know, bringing in people has, has helped a lot. Yeah. The challenge with us is we're kind of like a high volume, lower, smaller deal size type of company right now. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of investors, um, companies, if they have a team or partners where they maybe do three, four transactions a year that are hundred plus units. And then, you know, that's their year. Um, we're kind of on the other side of that where we're doing 10 to 15 deals a year, but they're smaller in size. So we're constantly coordinating transactions. We're constantly asset managing and operating deals that are, you know, just more dresses to look after, right? As I like to call it. Um, so it got to the point where my week between asset management, like on the operation side, um, transaction coordination, and then just like trying to, to do all of the other stuff in between, throw out a podcast episode, right, you know, go speak with investors, do all of these different things. I was just working like 80 hours a week. And I was like, this is not a sustainable, this isn't why I got into this business, fundamentally speaking. So I knew that in order to build the foundation to continue doing a higher volume of these deals, which is what we're going to be continuing to do into the short term, because we want to keep our deal size small, where we can really compete and amidst some of this market turbulence and uncertainty. Um, and then we'll probably get back to trying to scale the business and do slightly lower volume of larger deals. But in the short term, I need someone to help me out with all that. So we hired a, um, a director of operations in our business, like a you know US-based salaried employee. And um, it's been pretty game-changing. Um, he's taken all the asset management off of my plate from like a, you know, hop on the weekly calls and look at the KPIs, stuff that, um, you know, I'm still available for like the larger decision-making strategic type decisions. And, um, and then he helps with transaction coordination. And then uh, a lot of the other stuff that comes up in the business, uh, just that are more one-off, he's helping with too. Like we need to build out a better system for, um, you know, coordinating transactions on monday.com. All right. So, you know, he builds that out. Right. So it's been a, immensely helpful. And, um, you know, I think in 30 days, he's really going to be owning all of those processes like 90 days in, and, and then I'm going to be able to dedicate much more of my time to, to, to finding deals and raising money, which is that's what drives the results. And I was starting to get pulled away from that pretty significantly. Um, so it, it's been, um, it's been an unbelievable hire and it's petrifying because it makes the difference, the the business, a whole different thing, you know, where you have you know, salaries. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's, it's not just you, right. And that was, so it was a really hard decision for me to make. And it took me probably a year too long to make it, but it's now given the runway to do, to keep growing for the next two, three years, um, in a much more sustainable way, just from like a, a stress management standpoint on my end, which is <laughs> how I'm starting to think about the business now. I I can imagine. And and you have partners, correct? At at aligned? No, it's just me. Oh um, wow. Okay. Yeah. So so it was I was a one man band, really. I had 10 balls in the air at any given time. And um and and I think that the challenge really became um yeah, that worked. And I was pet so my whole thing, the reason I got into real estate, I wanted to work for myself. And having partners at the business level was was very nerve wracking to me because I only wanted to answer to myself. And even having yeah. an employee, right? You know, we have employee, we have a few VAs, but even that's still like I I still, you know, it creates much more accountability as an individual. Um, 
but at some point you realize like the service that I'm providing everybody around me is, uh, is damaged by the fact that I'm doing everything. So even if somebody, you know, I do a great job at asset management, I do a pretty good job at investor relations, but if I'm doing all of these things, then they naturally suffer in each individual silo. So hiring somebody to own that pillar of the business makes that inherently, he's going to do a better job than me, even if I know it better, because they're just spending more time on it. Um, which is the mindset shift that took me a while to make, but um, it's been a little freeing for sure to bring somebody else and at least have somebody else to bounce things off of and to work with on. That's awesome. I love it. And and congrats. I, sounds, sounds like it's been a, a huge relief, but it is, it's hard to give up that control, especially of those key points in the business, right? Where you're like, this is not something that, oh, it's, you know, there's this big Martin Frere and it's okay that it takes you two or three months to figure it out. It's like, no, we got to make sure you know what's going on within the first like two or three, you know, meetings. So that, that can be challenging. So what was that like interviewing people and kind of like doing that? Did it feel strange to be like, what? Yeah. I'm hiring someone. It felt very, very strange. Um, it, it, it's, I almost, you know, it's, I got, I got a lot of the uh, imposter syndrome stuff where I was like, this just feels odd. Like, and it, you know, I don't know. Cause I'd never hired somebody, I hired VAs, but that's, I don't even, that's not even comparable to hiring like a U.S. based totally. employee. That's like, I have kids. <laughs> so it's a to- <laughs> that's a totally different ball game um, in a lot of ways. And it's also just a bigger bet from a business level. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was very nerve wracking. I did take my time. I really wanted to make sure I got it right. Um, and I wanted to make sure I found somebody that could that could stay with the business for an extended period of time. So I set an absurd amount of expectations up front as I went through interviews where I was like, I really do need someone that's committed to this for at least a couple of years, a few years. And um, and I tried to get a sense in the interview process, like if that was, you know, I really looked at job history at how long were you, you know, working at your previous company. Um, so that was that was the big thing for me was because I was like, I, I need to hit the compounding effect where you've truly owned a lot of these processes. And then even if you leave, I'm more comfortable with how to delegate. Um, and then the other piece of it too, is I've never had a corporate job personally. I've only ever worked for myself. So I had, you know, just no idea like how to run a business. So it's funny because <laughs> his name's Ivan. So I'm like, you actually kind of have to manage me because I actually have no idea. Like I've never, I've never had a boss. I've never really worked in an office. So I don't really know what that's like. Um, so he's like, Hey, we just kind of have to do some of these weekly calls on Monday afternoons. Like that's what is normal in a business. And I'm like, perfect. I'm glad that you're saying that (laughs) because, (laughs) because that's news to me. So it's, it's kind of a a funny little inverse relationship in a way there, but it works out. Yeah, I know that's something I've, um, and, and I just have a VA as well, but you know, every once in a while, she'll shoot me an email and be like, uh, I haven't heard from you and just want to like, make sure everything's good. It's like, yeah, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to. I just have not don't have anything to say, you know, but yeah. in reality, when you actually get to that point, it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. We actually need to, to talk. <laughs> yeah. Especially if everybody's remote, you know, he's remote and it's a whole nother set of like, you kind of have to, you have to manufacture touch points along the way. Um, especially if you're like a busy business owner where you just wake up and you think of all the shit you got to do and it's, and you kind of forget that, you know, you need to, you need to be coaching the team. It, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging transition. I'm still working through it now. I mean, going from just being a deal guy to like a, like a business owner. I mean, that's a massive shift from like a mental standpoint. Totally. I love it. Well, congrats. You're obviously doing great things. And um, this has been awesome. Brought a lot of value. So we're very grateful for that. So we'll go ahead and wind down here into the final five. Uh, First question, best advice you've gotten from a mentor. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, (laughs) I think, um, So the same guy that gave me the piece of advice that if you can always find great deals, you'll never be broke. Um, You you know, you always have a place in the business is how he phrased it. He also said um, that you you need to focus on getting something off of your plate early. Um, And for me, I was 22. I was like managing, you know, I was doing my own property management for 15 units. And it sounds so simple, especially to a lot of the sophisticated people here. But like just hiring a property manager was a massive step for me, like a Mentally couldn't get, I couldn't get away from, I don't want to spend 10% on a, you know, but that blew up my business because I hated it. It didn't allow me to focus on finding deals. And then I, you know, quickly hired a VA to send emails out of my email account and to, uh, to help underwrite deals on a, at a high level. And that was game changing. It allowed me, you know, kind of helped me build the tools to, 
to know that or build the skills, I should say, to, to know that that's how a business grows. And, um, and it was helpful advice because I oftentimes, I think a lot of solo investors, the, the investors that get into the business just by themselves, they think of it as investing, not as running a business. Um, and, it, and oftentimes I just see it takes investors so long to outsource things, whatever it is in their business, whether it's management or whether it's their accounting, just hiring a third party bookkeeper, like any of these little things to buy your time back is critical. And I was, I was very quick to do that early on in hindsight. And I think it was because I was told to do that, which I appreciated. Yeah, that's awesome advice. That's definitely something that I struggle with. It's going to be really fun here in the next couple of months going back through and actually getting all my books caught up. And I know it's going to lead to me finding some third party, but that's what it takes sometimes when you're kind of a stubborn entrepreneur is like, that like final straw moment, we're just like, all right, it's time. Like I have to do it now. I can't keep, keep. You have to hit that point of no return where it's just like, this is insane. Like that's, that was me hiring someone. I was like, I had worked like 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. for literally 30 days. I was like, this is absurd. What am I doing? This is literally not how this is supposed to go. Like you're right. I, I, but I identify with that. So I wanted to harp on it. You kind of have, oftentimes you have to hit that point before you take the advice that other people are telling you and then implement it, which is funny. Yeah. I mean, I think it just speaks to our personalities, right? It's like, we just sort of go, go, go. We're willing to do stuff too. That's the other thing that people don't talk about is when you're willing to do it, even if you don't like it, you know, like there were some things I identified very early on that I just wasn't even willing to do, which is like the little things, nuanced stuff that my VA does. Mm -hmm. Um, But other than that, it's like, yeah, you know, I want to learn all of it. So Uh, cool. Uh, What is about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Um, for me, everything is about finding my potential. It's pretty black and white for me. Um, I don't have the traditional why of like, I'm, I'm not married. I don't have kids yet. Um, I think that's probably why a lot of people get into what they do. And I'm sure I'll have kids and be like, Oh, I'm glad that I did all that stuff the last 10 years or whatever. But for me right now, it's like, I, um, it's, I want to fulfill my potential. I also just don't know what else I'd be doing. Like the alternative to me seems, seems very dull um, of, of, so, you know, you can work a job forever and it's, it's safer, but like, what are you saying to people when you're 65, what kind of life stories have you developed? Um, you know, you, you, there's probably a lot of regret that comes with doing that. So for me, it's like, yeah, I'd rather run a business and sure it's more stressful and it's higher variance and I work more and all of these things, but I find that to be a much better life story. Um, so that, that combined with, I just want to see what I'm able to do, I think is what drives me. Yes, I I agree. And, and the thing about, I feel like this industry is it's very front loaded, right? So like all the grind and everything Mm. is happening now so that in 10, 15, 20 years from now, it's just like a well-oiled machine that you just, you know, kind of runs itself basically, Right. Whereas I feel like the W2 world, although, you know, the world needs good employees, I'm not knocking that because I used to think that everybody should should be an entrepreneur. And and by some degree, I think that you should have that, like whether it's a side hustle, but the world does need good employees. And of course, and that's OK. Like you can do fine. Or, you know, you can do really well. It's just more steady. Right. You're going to have to work longer, I think, is is ultimately what what that leads to. Yeah. And this is just for me, you know, right, I just correct. happen to be wired in such a way that this is what I find to be intriguing. Um, I'm not, I don't have family or friends outside of my parents, like that are entrepreneurs. Like I'm the, I'm the lone one that is in this game. Yeah. Um, you know, which for me, it's like, Hey, this is not for everybody. This is an extremely stressful and taxing choice that I've made to spend my time professionally, but, but that's what I personally enjoy. So you're, you're totally right. Everybody is completely different. And I think what drives people is totally different as well. Right. And there's symbiotic relationships in this industry, right? Because like, you know, once, like we were talking offline, once our friends get to that high income earning stage, you know, like I've already got a few there who who are um, my investors, some of my investors, and it's nice because it's right. It's like, hey, look, like you can still get everything that I get without having to change anything, you know? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Makes sense. Um, Cool. Favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Favorite non-real estate, non-investment related book? Probably the, uh, just the Bourne books, the Ludlum books. If I'm, if we're talking fiction, I think those are the only books I've ever really like read (laughs) now that I think about it. Um, but I'm a huge like action movies guy. Like I love like early mid two thousands, like 
both good and bad action the movies. I'm a huge ones, fan of, man. I, they're my I, I love them, dude. I have a <laughs> I have a group chat with a few of my friends just called Shitty Action Movies, and um, <laughs> and we just talk about bad. Like anytime, like the John Wick Four trailer coming out yesterday, we were just we dissected that for a while. No um, way, I'm gonna have to go check it out. Yeah, it's John it's Wick. it's pretty wild stuff. But I'm getting sidetracked. Probably the uh, the Born series from like a book standpoint. Those are all great reads. Love it. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh man. Probably flying. That seems yeah. pretty killer. Um, I mean, you'd be the coolest superhero. Like, <laughs> I mean, one that's convenient, and two, it's pretty cool. So, yeah, I would have to say fly. I mean, that's the one that initially came to my mind. So that's got to be it. Yeah, that's that's me too. A thousand percent. Uh, cool. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? So our uh, website is alignedrep.com. If you want to get on our list, alignedrep.com slash invest. And um, you mentioned the the course that we just brought out. Um, it's, you know, just my opportunity to try and share what we've learned doing this for, you know, six years at a high level with everybody out there. And, you know, we're not trying to make a ton of money off of it. It's just a way to show other people how to do it so we can partner with them on their deals. And that was always my motivation. And that's uh multifamilywealtheducation.com slash off market, which is all one word. Cool. We'll link down the show notes, make it super easy. Axel, you're the man. Thanks so much for joining us. Awesome. Dude, this was great, Johnny. I appreciate the invite. Absolutely. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to KataniCapitalGroup.com to learn more.